the Miami Hurricanes are about to play their first road game of the season. So whose stock is rising heading into the matchup with Temple? You are Locked on Canes, your daily podcast on the Miami Hurricanes, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. I am Alex Dono, University of Miami alumnus, longtime South Florida sports radio vet and contributor to allhurricanes.com. And thank you so much to the everydayers for making Locked on Canes your first listen. Today's episode is brought to you by Bird Dogs. Go to birddogs.com slash locked on college or enter promo code locked on college for a free water bottle with any purchase. You won't want to take your bird dogs off. We promise you. So finally, we get to see the Hurricanes tested on the road. All three games have been at home so far. They've looked impressive all three times out. That's why the stock has been almost universally soaring for most everybody on the team. Hurricanes, I know, favored to beat Temple easily, but you could have some questionable weather up there in Philly, and it is the first time they're going to hit the road this year. So it's really interesting, but We've been pretty reassured by the way Miami has played so far at the line of scrimmage, at the quarterback position. The tackling has been solid. We're feeling good about our 20th ranked Miami Hurricanes. So whose stock is going up? Whose stock is soaring? You know what? I've been getting complaints the last few weeks about the Uncle Louie impression. So maybe we'll cool off with Uncle Louie. Hey, kid, come here. I got a hot stock tip for you. I don't know, man. You guys tell me. Is the Uncle, is the Uncle Louie thing too much for you? But I'll tell you whose stock has been soaring to start the year. Let's start with QB1. Tyler Van Dyke, TVD through three games, is the third rated quarterback in the entire country, according to the Pro Football Focus metrics. And through three games, and by the way, in two of those, he didn't actually have to finish the game. Van Dyke has 822 passing yards with eight touchdowns and one interception. That's a great ratio. And surprisingly enough, that one INT was not thrown against Texas A&M's defense. He was clean in that game, five touchdowns, zero INTs. It was actually in the first game of the year against Miami of Ohio. But TVD has been trending way, way up. And with TVD trending, you figure some of these wide receivers have got to be trending as well. Xavier Restrepo and Jacoby George in particular. To the moon is where their stock is going. X especially. Restrepo is rated second in the entire country by pro football focus among receivers with at least 10 targets this season. He's on back-to-back 120-plus yard receiving games. And Jacoby George, meanwhile, has become the human touchdown machine. He's already got four touchdown receptions this year in three games. He could end up eclipsing double digits, probably 10, 12 touchdowns by the end of the year, if not more. Let's go over to the defense for stock soaring. I don't think anybody on Miami's defense is seeing their stock rise as much in the first three games as Jaden Davis at cornerback. Sound in coverage, one of the best tacklers on the team. That hit he made to force the fumble for the takeaway against Texas A&M was perfect. Jaden Davis has been a revelation. I knew, you know, coming in from Oklahoma where he transferred from, I knew this was a player to watch, and I was thinking maybe he could be the starting nickel, but he's a little undersized. He's been playing outside corner, and he's been among the very best in the country. Jaden Davis has been a revelation. I knew he was a player to watch, but I didn't realize he would be this good, okay? Sticking with the defense. Someone else whose stock has been going way up so far, Ruben Hurricane Bain, right? His role has increased. We'll see if it's a temporary increase or a permanent increase, but with so many injuries to veterans on the defensive line, Ruben Bain has become a starter now. He got his first collegiate sack against Bethune-Cookman last week in his first collegiate start. He literally suplexed their quarterback. It was awesome. Uh, and, you know, we talked with Lance Guidry and Mario Cristobal on Monday about Ruben Bain, and I think it was Guidry who said he handles himself like a veteran, right? You would never know that this is a true freshman. He is a consummate professional. And as we all know, going back to his high school days at Miami Central, where he was terrorizing quarterbacks left and right, he's got a motor and he's got a skill set that is God-given. I mean, Ruben Bain is just a special, special player. 
Someone else on defense whose stock has been really rising, Daryl Porter. Before the season started, I was not 100% sure that Porter would be a starter because there was a good competition at cornerback, but I did suspect he would start. Not only has he done that, he's taken that job and he's ran with it. Porter is on his way to a really special year at cornerback at Miami. He's doing really, really well. Not to be overshadowed by what Jaden Davis has been doing because Daryl Porter Jr. has also been awesome. Um, something else where the stock has really been rising this year. Running back by committee. If you guys watched our episode last night with Don Solinger, if you haven't done so, I highly encourage you to watch legendary former Miami Hurricanes running backs coach, assistant coach, also legendary high school coach. Don Solinger joined us uh, on a special episode last night, and he was gushing not only about the ability of Miami's running backs to actually run the football, but how well they pass block. That's a big thing for Solinger. Um, he's been really complimentary about that. So Miami's running back by committee has been awesome. We just saw A.J. Allen score his first two touchdowns in a Miami uniform. Don Chaney had an awesome game. Henry Parrish has been really good. You know, we uh, we haven't seen uh, Mark Fletcher since the second game. I think he's doing better now. He was really good in the times we got to watch Fletcher. And we even got to see Chris Johnson. He got his first action against Bethune-Cookman last Thursday. He scored his first collegiate touchdown and was blazing fast in doing so. So right now, the running back by committee, which definitely reminded Coach Solinger of some of the running backs, running back rooms that he had when he was at the U, where you've got you know a bunch of special players in that room. And so far, Tim Harris is doing a really good job coaching these guys up, and Shannon Dawson is doing a really good job splitting up the reps and getting all of these players involved so far. And then... At some point, Trevante Citizen is going to be healthy again, and that's going to add another wrinkle into that running back room. I could have probably led off with this in terms of whose stock is rising. The entire offensive line. And that's the single biggest difference from last year, right? You want to ask me, what's the single most dramatic change from 5-7 and seven team last year to you know 3-0 and oh and counting team this year? The quality of the offensive line, we've not only seen them opening up running lanes, but they've allowed Tyler Van Dyke to reach his potential again because of the way that they protect him. David Lake at 24-7 inside the U crunch some of the numbers, so I credit David for this. From a pass protection standpoint, Tyler Van Dyke has had a clean pocket to operate with on 80.5% of his dropbacks, according to Pro Football Focus. And on those clean pocket dropbacks, Van Dyke is completing 84% of his throws while averaging 11.9 yards per attempt and totaling eight touchdowns against one interception. Of the quarterbacks that have played a significant amount of snaps through the first uh, three games, only Michigan's J.J. McCarthy, USC's Caleb Williams, and Colorado's Shador Sanders have a higher completion percentage when operating from a clean pocket. And by the way, all three of those are just fractions higher than Van Dyke. Van Dyke uh, at 84%. The other three that are above him are in the 85 percentile. And according to Pro Football Focus, Van Dyke has dealt with only 15 quarterback pressures on the year, which ranks uh, at sixth least among quarterbacks that have totaled at least 60 dropbacks on the season. And obviously... You know, Bethune-Cookman being one of those opponents is going to skew some of those numbers a little bit. But we'll be reminded how well that offensive line did against a really talented Texas A&M team and against a pretty good Miami-Ohio team. I don't think people give Miami-Ohio credit. Like, that's not a, a pushover opponent. That That's a good group of five opponents. So that's your Kane stock report. I'm going to be answering you guys' questions when we come back. And, man, we've got some good ones, Okay. The challenges of playing in your first road game this season. What to expect from Temple. And folks, I've avoided it up until today. We have to have a conversation about Miami's alumni. Some of Miami's most high-profile football alumni chasing that spotlight out there with Deion Sanders in Boulder. What do we think of that? What do we think of some of the most high-profile football alumni at Miami putting on the Colorado gear and, you know, seemingly ignoring their alma mater a little bit. We will get into that and so much more. As we like to say, we are only getting started right here on Locked on Canes. 
let's talk about bird dogs. First of all, folks, these bird dog shorts, they make you look good. They make your legs look good. I get compliments from my wife, and I've been married 12 years. I rarely get compliments from her these days about anything. Bird dog stretch khaki shorts are designed to fit slimmer through the thigh and leg, giving you a truly sculpted look. They do the exact same thing as Lululemon, but they fit way better. I've tried both. I can vouch for that. They fit way better than those regular shorts that are made of a stiff, restricting cotton. Bird Dogs fixed this issue by inventing cloud knit fabric that looks just like khaki, but it stretches so you get a way slimmer fit without having to sacrifice movement. And most importantly, with this hot summer, we've been, I know it's fall. I, is it fall yet? What I, I don't know seasons. I live in Miami, but it's been the hottest summer on record. And Bird Dogs uses anti-stink sweat whipping fat wicking fabric that keeps you cool and dry all day long. They are so clutch. Guys, I, I was back in Orlando at some theme parks last weekend, and I was so cool in my Bird Dogs. They are functional for every occasion, guys. So you want to go to birddogs.com slash locked on college or enter promo code locked on college at checkout for a free bird dogs water bottle with every order. That's birddogs.com slash locked on college for a free water bottle at checkout. You won't want to take your bird dogs off. We promise you. Thank you so much for making Locked on Canes your first listen today. Thank you to the everydayers. If you want to take your everydayer experience to the next level, sign up for our exclusive SMS texting community through subtext. I include the link in the show description below. You get text messages directly from my phone to yours with breaking news. You can ask me one-on-one -on -one questions. We'll be answering you guys' questions in just a second here. Uh, all sorts of recruiting scoops. Try it free for 14 days with the link below. And then if you like it, you can opt in for $4.99 a month. We give you a lot of added value on there. All right, so we get a, a – this is more of a comment than a question, but one of our listeners is in Philadelphia. It's where the Miami Hurricanes will be playing this weekend at Temple. First road game of the year. He says, FYI, Saturday's forecast up here is northwest winds, 10 to 20 miles per hour, rain, and they are predicting around an inch of rain. Uh, the high temperature is around 68, he says. The O-line and running game need to be in high gear. That's from Salty Warrior up in Philadelphia. Uh, now, luckily for us, Miami has a diverse enough offense. I think they can thrive in any conditions. Now, if there is a lot of rain, that could negate some of the speed of Miami's offensive skill position, guys. That's unfortunate, but at the same time, Miami's offensive line is built for the muck, okay? Miami's running game should be able to open some holes, and, you know, you can definitely still accomplish some things, assuming it's not like a complete, you know, downpour and mud fest. You know, I, I think Miami can still generate a passing game, but if they do need to pivot to more of a ground attack and a grind-out attack, he, he, they've got the offensive line to do it. Hopefully your tackling translates to bad weather on defense. So I, I think no matter what the conditions, you know, you know, obviously Miami is going to be on paper the faster team compared to Temple. So bad weather could negate some of your speed, maybe make the game a little bit closer. But I still think Miami has, you know, the type of team that can win in poor conditions. I, I think to me, you know, regardless of what the weather looks like, it's going to be interesting watching the Canes on the road for the first time this year. And I've seen Miami favored by as many as 25 and a half points for this game. Um, I'm not saying they can't cover, but I'm probably not going to, you know, place a wager at minus 25 and a half because I just want to see the, how this team functions on the road. You know, obviously there's going to be tougher road games coming up this year, but I just want to see how this team functions on the road. Treat it like a business trip. I know that's what Mario Cristobal has been saying this week, uh, but it's definitely interesting to see your team on the road for the first time. And you know, we're going to hear a lot between now and Saturday uh, about EJ Warner, son of Kurt Warner, quarterback at Temple, uh, and especially his quick release because Miami has a really good pass rush. All right. You saw how much they were pressuring Connor Wegman a couple weeks ago against Texas A&M. They keep quarterbacks under constant duress. Uh, the quarterback you're facing on Saturday has one of the quickest releases in the entire country. He averages 2.3 seconds before he releases the football. So, you know, you can still obviously pressure him, make him uncomfortable. But, uh, you know, don't expect to sack him too many times because he gets rid of the football so quickly. So that's going to put Miami's defense to the test this week. 
All right, here's the, the trillion dollar question. We get this from Giant Ninja, who says, you've probably been asked this before, but here we go. How does Dono really feel about former Canes supporting another university to the point that they are wearing that gear to promote? Giant Ninja, I find it to be really annoying. OK, and no, I'm not jealous of Colorado because I know that's what some of the Colorado fans are saying. And, and by the way, how many of them have actually like been fans for more than like six months? But that I know a lot of the Colorado fans. Oh, Miami fans are so jealous because look at it. Look at all the attention we're getting. It's not about jealousy. OK, I think no matter what university you support, the idea of seeing some of your most prominent football alumni spending this much time sucking up to a different program while their own alma mater is playing really good football right now, it's aggravating. It's annoying. On the day that Miami was beating Texas A&M, which was a signature win for our program and for the program of these alums, a handful of our top guys were seemingly ignoring Miami because they were out in Boulder wearing Colorado gear, watching Colorado against Nebraska. Ed, listen, case by case, there's reasons why these guys are doing what they're doing. Michael Irvin is doing it primarily for his TV gig and for the exposure. Warren Sapp is basically out there begging Deion Sanders for a job, and he'll probably get one next year. And The Rock, he was out in Denver for a pro wrestling gig. They invited him on to college game day. Uh, and here's the thing about this, folks. And, you know, if in Colorado, they're obviously off to a great start. Uh, if they start to lose games, some of this buzz is going to fizzle out. That's just the way the world works, especially this day and age when it's all about, you know, 140 characters, social media, TikTok, whatever people are using these days. So these guys, they're out there sucking up to Dion because it's good for their brand. Right now, being associated with Colorado Buffaloes football is the equivalent of marrying a Kardashian. That's what that is right now. You associate yourself with Colorado. It gets you in the news. It gets you in the blogs. It raises your profile. So I can understand it to a certain extent because these guys have brands they're trying to promote. Some of them are trying to get jobs on Dion's coaching staff. But I completely agree with what Alonzo Highsmith said about the situation, who is another prominent Miami alum who happens to be Miami's uh, GM of football operations, him saying that putting on the Colorado gear, that's a step too far. Putting on the jersey of another program, I think is too much, right? Because Miami, we need, as they have been for you know the past 40 some odd years, we need Miami's alums to be ambassadors for Miami because it helps in recruiting, right? You put on the Colorado gear instead of the Miami gear, it's going to help Dion's recruiting, potentially at the expense of your own recruiting. It's not a good look. Here's what Alonzo Highsmith tweeted, and I completely agree with it. He says, seems like every former player is a Colorado Buffalo now. I guess we'll just keep on pressing on with our bunker mentality. It's us and only us, and I support Dion, but you couldn't pay me to wear a Colorado Buffalo shirt. Bravo, Alonso. That was so well said. And, you know, I think that what he said, actually, I think it may have made Dwayne Johnson realize, you know what, he may be right about that. Because I noticed that, like, right after Alonso Highsmith said what he said, suddenly our guy, Dwayne, and by the way, I don't, I don't want to disparage Dwayne Johnson in any way, because he has, he has given so much back to the university, including big-time donations to the point where, the weight room and the locker room are named after him. So I'm not trying to disparage Dwayne Johnson, but, you know, he did have the Colorado jersey on on college game day. And then after Alonzo said what he said, I noticed uh, The Rock starts tweeting out a lot of nice things about the Canes, which is great. And he complimented Armando Blunt, who committed to Miami last week. So we need more of that. Like, we need more of that from The Rock and less of The Rock putting on a Colorado Buffaloes jersey. Can we get more of the Kane stuff and a little bit less of the other thing, all right? So that's where I'm not losing any sleep over it, but, you know, it's it's a little cringe, okay? It's a little cringe to see some of the most prominent Miami football alumni out there sucking up to Dion because they want to get that Kardashian type of attention out there. It is what it is, all right? All right, so we have 
More questions on the other side. Uh, where does Miami stand now in the ACC? Because heading into the season, uh, everybody outside of South Florida had teams like Clemson, North Carolina, a lot of people, even NC State and potentially Louisville, all ranked above Miami. Where do things stand now? Uh, and uh, people are concerned about members of Miami's coaching staff being poached. We will talk about all of this and so much more. Folks, you want to keep it locked right here to Locked on Canes. I am so happy that Jace Medical is now part of the Locked on family. Guys, the Jace case provides five life-saving antibiotics for emergency use. All it takes to get a Jace case is you fill out a simple online form and in some cases jump on a quick call with one of their board certified physicians. Because bottom line, guys, we've seen this over the last few years. During the pandemic, it was difficult to get medications and supplies you need. And even ongoing with the supply chain issues, sometimes you can't get, at least not in a timely manner, the life-saving antibiotics that you need out there. I, I believe every person on this planet is entitled to be able to have access to life-saving medications. And that's what Jace Medical provides for you. Do not be caught unprepared. They handle everything at Jace Medical from online evalu evaluation to licensed pharmacy medication delivery and ongoing consultation and care. So folks, save more than $360 by getting these life-saving antibiotics with Jace Medical plus an additional $20 off by using my code Locked on at checkout on jacemedical.com. That's J-A-S-E medical.com. Save more than $360 and an extra $20 off using code locked on at jacemedical.com. Thank you so much for making Locked on Canes your first listen today. We're available free wherever you get your podcasts and we're available free on YouTube. And for the everydayers, Make sure you're in every Friday or as well. Oh, that was terrible. I'll try harder next time. But college football season is here. This season, Locked On has kicked up our coverage a notch with Locked On College Football Kickoff Live. Each Friday, we go live from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Eastern on every Locked On College YouTube channel, including this one. And I'm part of that show. I know I was out last week on vacation. I am back this week. College Football Kickoff Live covers playoff implications, the conference rivalry games, and we go in-depth like only Locked On can, including insight and analysis from our stable of Locked On College hosts covering every team every day, 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Eastern Time Live every Friday. You will not want to miss it. Thank you so much for making Locked On Canes your first listen today. All right, let's get to some more of your questions. Uh, we get uh, we get a, a twofer here from a Mary Kane, a Mary Kane, who says, hey, Dono, do you think it's reasonable to rank Miami above Clemson, UNC and Duke, even though they have all had our number for the past few years? Um, you know, honestly, uh, Duke, Miami, they don't have Duke on the schedule this year. But, you know, what what, it, what I, I, I'm not like thinking about ranking Miami ahead of Clemson and UNC until I see those head to heads, right? You've got a big home game against Clemson in October. Uh, in a few weeks, you're going to have UNC on the road, which is a huge, huge game. I believe the tide has turned in both directions. I don't think Clemson is what they used to be still very good and very talented, but this is not your daddy's Clemson, as we like to say whereas Miami is on the rise. I think Miami can beat Clemson at home this year, and I do. I am cautiously optimistic that Miami is a better team this year than the North Carolina Tar Heels. Winning up there is easier said than done. But, uh, you know, as far as you guys know me, I'm not big on rankings. You know, Miami is now number 20 in the country, and I appreciate that. But, you know, I'm not a big rankings guy until we see some of these head-to-heads and we see how things play out, right? Um, we get another question from American. Does Mario's win over Texas A&M bust the narrative that he can't win the big games, or do we need to see the outcomes of UNC and Clemson? Uh, first of all, you know Mario's won some really big. I mean, I, I guess you're just talking about Mario at Miami because Mario at Oregon. You know, he uh, I saw I saw his team run all over Ohio State a couple of years ago in Mario's final season in Oregon. They won Rose Bowls there. They won Pac-12 championships there. So that shouldn't be a narrative like M Mario not winning big games should not be a narrative. Uh, but listen, yeah, um, beating Texas A&M is great. You can't lose all of these big games coming up. You got to win some of these games, right? Florida State on the road will be tough. 
Clemson, North Carolina, Louisville at the end of the year is not going to be an easy game. You need to win some more of these games, but I, I don't think that would be a fair narrative on Mario Cristobal at all. We get a question from the 561 who says, should the Canes family be concerned about coaching staff being poached given the quick turnaround of the program? If so, what are the what would be the potential recruiting fallout? Um, listen, I'm not I'm not really that concerned about coaches being poached because for one, if you're doing so well, that's the cost of winning, right? The cost of winning games is your assistant coaches become more attractive. Um, I don't think I'm not worried about losing the coordinators anytime soon, because I, I think in the case of, of Gidry and Dawson, they're both, you know, relatively younger up and coming guys. I don't necessarily think off of one good year, they're going to be getting power five head coaching offers. Like, I think they're probably a couple of years away from something like that happening. And I'm not worried about Miami losing coordinators to other coordinator jobs, lateral moves, because guess what? Miami is no longer cheap with paying assistance, right? You know, in the old days, you might lose a defensive coordinator to a defensive coordinator job somewhere else because they were going to get double, tripled salary. That's not the case anymore. Miami is willing to, you know, to pay coaches these days to keep the staff in harmony. So honestly, I'm not worried about it. And also, you know, you look at guys like, Kevin Beard freaking loves Miami. Tim Harris loves Miami. These guys aren't going to leave for the sake of leaving. You know, we'll see if Jason Taylor starts getting more NFL offers. But no, I'm, I'm not I'm not worried. You know, sometimes that's the cost of success. But specifically, I am not worried about losing too many assistant coaches this year. I'm not. We get a question from Storm Life who says, hey, what was Cam Kinchin's injury diagnosis? And will he play this week versus Temple? I don't want to speculate on what is diagnosed. First of all, I don't know. I also don't want to speculate, and that's something uh, Mario was asked that question last week. He he didn't answer it because it's, it's a medical privacy thing. Um, now, just going off the facts, we know Cam was cleared and released from the hospital very quickly, and all of the serious tests were negative, which is fantastic. He seems to be doing all right. As far as whether he'll play against Temple, I would probably, you know, this is my guess. I would probably lean to no because if it was, you know, just based on what happened to him on the field, if there, you know, any head injury concern, um, you know, you, you don't, you don't want to rush him back on the field. And I think, you know, Jaden Harris and James Williams, I think can certainly get the job done at the safety positions this weekend against Temple. I wouldn't rush Cam back, even if he is doing all right. So just my hunch, I don't expect he's going to play this week. Uh, Texter writes or seven eight seven oh six writes. If Tyler Van Dyke does not return next year, how does that affect our wide receiver recruiting class? Um, I don't think it. I don't think Tyler Van Dyke leaving. If he does decide to leave, I don't think that would affect it at all because I think the wide receivers that are being recruited, they know TVD is an upperclassman and he could very likely make a jump to the NFL. I think they're more concerned with how is Emory Williams looking really good in the limited times he's played. Uh, Judd Anderson is now having a nice year at Warner Robins High School. And Luke Nickel, class of 2025, that dude looks like the truth. So I think they're, I, I think recruits are not really thinking about Tyler Van Dyke. I think they're already thinking about, you know, the quarterback that they're more likely to play with once they arrive. So I don't think TBD, his status really affects anything. All right. All right, so I want to thank you guys so much. There's some questions we did not have time to get to. I want to get to on the next episode, folks. It's been a fun week already. I appreciate the birthday wishes. Uh, yesterday was my, my 39th birthday. Man, I'm over the hill. So I appreciate the birthday wishes. Uh, I did two episodes on my birthday because that's the way I wanted to celebrate. I love that. That just goes how much I love what I do, right? A lot of people would be like, oh, it's my birthday. I don't want to work today. It's my birthday. For me, it's like it's my birthday. I want to work extra today because I love this. I'm living my dream every single day here on Locked on Kane. So thank you guys so much for supporting the show. Thank you so much to the everydayers. Uh, if you're watching us on YouTube, hit that thumbs up button. Make sure to subscribe. If you're listening to the audio version, make sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Odyssey app, wherever you get your podcasts. And if you'd like to sign up for our SMS texting community through subtext. You can click the link in the show description below. We will talk to you again next time on another episode of Locked on Canes, part of the awesome Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day.